She Slayers, and welcome to another episode of She Slays the Day podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Brunswick. Okay, so I have like a rant. Um, you know me in my rants, and like I'm just gonna speak for all the millennials and Gen X here. Gen Z, you are throwing me with your engagement rings, okay? <laughs> Immediately, millennials and Gen X were like, yeah, okay, I'm glad someone said something. So I come from the era where we were fed lies that uh, you had to buy a blood diamond and you were supposed to spend, what was it, like 10% of your income or something? The guy's income was supposed to go towards the ring and like you could like, and then when your friends would get engaged, you would look at the size of her diamond and you did it really. I mean, I got married at 24. So like all of my friends, you know, you didn't really see anything larger than one and a half carats because once you start getting to two carats, you know, that's like a, it's like a, probably a $25,000 diamond. Okay like expensive. And like, obviously it all depends. So we came from this era of like, oh my God, I would never wear a cubic zirconia ring or like, it's like, you better have a real diamond. And you guys come in and this is one of your best traits. I will say it. I'm going to say it. I don't give you guys enough credit, but there are certain things that millennials held on to from like previous generations that was kind of stupid and needed to like, let go. And like the whole 10% on your wedding ring thing needs to go. Um, but you guys are coming in just shameless with these like three or four carat looking diamonds that are not diamonds. Like they're like some lab thing or glass or I don't know. I'm not up and with it with like what they are. But I can tell you that my chiropractic intern who doesn't have a job yet is still in school does not, you know, or like whoever it is, like the person coming and shadowing me, who's a T3 at school and shows up with a five carat looking thing. I'm like, huh. And y'all just like, don't, you don't say anything about it. Like you just, which is fine. I guess that's, that's the memo you guys got on that training. You know, like for me, oh, well, now that I'm saying it, this is something I would like to like, oh, you know, if somebody's like, oh my God, your hair's so pretty. I go, thanks. It's fake what I say. It's kind of a true story. I have learned, like, I don't need to, like, if somebody uh, is like passing me at the grocery store or at the airport and they say, or like, you know, in the airport bathroom, I don't know why the airport. Well, you know why? Because I have my hair and makeup done and that's not because I look good when I travel. Well, I have hair and makeup done, sweat. So it's like, oh, I'm casual. I do this all the time. But anyways, I've learned that I don't need to tell that person. Thanks. It's fake. Um, I've learned to just go, thank you. But you guys are doing that with your rings. You, so if, if now, if you are under the age of like 28 and you have said beautiful, large diamond looking $50,000 looking engagement ring, and you haven't thought about this because you're just in this era, just so you know, anytime you show your ring to somebody who's over like 35, probably we're wondering what do they do for a living? <laughs> Who is Mr. or Mrs. Moneybags? And, you know, millennials and Gen Z, or no, sorry, Gen X, for those of you that have recently seen some engagement rings and you're like, how the heck? That's why. That's why. And it's not to them, it's not fake. Like to them, it's not like, that's just, it's something that they let go of. We were holding on to this like blood diamonds. You guys remember that movie? Yeah. It's depressing. So they were like, yeah, I don't need to spend $20,000 on impressing people with this thing. Like I have a beautiful ring that makes me happy and isn't going to turn my finger green. And then I can take that money and turn it on a down payment or something like that. So Yes. So props to you, but also not fair. Not fair. Bunch of 20 year olds got a bigger looking diamond than me. Joke, jokes. Uh, <laughs> so speaking of down payments, uh, today we have on Liz Faircloth and she is the co-founder of the Real Estate Invest Her community. Now for all my hymns listening, don't worry. We're just talking about real estate. 
No vagina necessary. Oh gosh. So I was at, side note, we'll come back to her by a sec. I was at Cairo Fest. And again, I had like two or three people come up and make a comment about like, oh, my husband listens to, or like a guy was like, I actually listened to like very apologetically. And I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of you. It's not a secret. I'm the she, you're the they. She slays their day. Ooh, maybe that's that's our rebrand. We're working on it. We're going to come up with a great one. Anyways, Liz Fairclaw. So she created the Invest Her Community, a platform to empower women to cultivate deeper connections, create generational wealth, and live a financially free and balanced life on their own terms. She is the co-host of the Real Estate Invest Her podcast and co-author of the bestseller, The Only Woman in the Room, Knowledge and Inspiration from 20 Successful Real Estate Women Investors. Liz believes she has a social responsibility to break the cycle and elevate women's financial literacy for generations to come. Um, and we have... Of I, I ask, like, what are the trends that we're seeing in investing in 2025? Is it too late to do real estate in some places or like at all? Is, it seems like everybody's doing it. Like, is there a different thing we should be doing? So stay tuned for questions like that. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for blessing this episode and the people listening. You know, I ask for just a little extra wisdom and clarity um, as we talk about the ins and outs of investing. Uh, help me share the information that's useful and inspiring and give the right words to keep those things engaging for the audience. Uh, keep me in making this episode, guide me, sorry, guide me in making this episode as valuable as possible. Um, for those who are listening and looking to grow their knowledge and for everyone out there thinking about their own investing journey, may they find encouragement in the right direction because it's scary, yo. All right. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Without further ado, here is my episode with Liz Faircloth on real estate. So you have a podcast, by the way, welcome to the show. This is it. <laughs> record a separate intro. So like so many times I'll have guests on and we're like 10 minutes in and they're like, um, just to let you know, I do. I'm like, oh, we're recording. This is this is it. This is organic. Um, so you you have a cool uh, sign behind you for your podcast. Yes. Does it light up? I want to see it lit it up. It does light up, but it broke because my uh, dog bit the um, cord, so now it doesn't light up anymore. But those are expensive. They're really expensive, and I I, I get so annoyed because I can't light my damn uh, sign up anymore. Well, I have, my cool, I have my cool thing. I used to just go like this, and it yep. lit up. But oh, anyway. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you're just gonna have to switch to the cheap Canva background with the neon sign, like I have. <laughs> and everybody listening on Apple and Spotify is like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then you should go to YouTube. So, <laughs> okay, Liz. So, you are co founder of the Real Estate Invest Her community and co host of Real Estate Invest Her podcast. Have you always been? in real estate? Like how long have you been doing this? Did you start yeah. as a real estate agent? <laughs> I didn't start as a real estate agent. So long story short, I was actually in um, grad school getting my degree in social work. So I had this dream of opening my own practice. And during my grad school, my brother-in-law, who was like the only entrepreneur I knew, handed me a little small purple book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. And that kind of forever shifted my like you know, what was possible, passive income, all these terms and entrepreneurship that I wasn't even quite honestly thinking about because I was like focused on being a counselor and, and a therapist. Mm -hmm. And so that actually caused me to get a job in consulting because one of the things in that book, it says, you know, if you're going to ever buy businesses or build businesses or buy property, you got to know how to sell. And I'm like, okay, I don't know how to sell. So maybe I should go learn how to sell. And so I joined this company, a small company, a consulting company that I was there for quite some time while my husband and I started investing in real estate. So yes, I have been involved in real estate for about 20 years. I bought our, we bought our first property, a duplex in my mid twenties. And, um, and then that really got our start. We borrowed some money from my father. It was outside of Philadelphia and um, borrowed about $30,000 to do the renovations to buy the property and then got our start in it in in property investing and that then led to other other properties and, and then it just kept going from and there then like ups and downs but yeah we we are um on the derosa side we're mostly syndicators on 
large multifamily. So we have a couple thousand units of multifamily property on the East Coast that we 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 own and manage with other investors. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of, of that part, uh, that, that real estate piece. So did you do what like I see recommended a lot of times for like first time owner, homeowners is like buying a duplex and living in half of it? Or did you guys already own your home and bought the duplex? That would have been a great idea, but no, we didn't do that. Actually, we um, we hadn't owned, we, we were, we bought the duplex before we actually lived together or we even had a home together. Uh, I was living in New Jersey. He was living in Philadelphia. We were engaged. So we didn't actually live together. Did you each own your own homes? I was living with my parents. He was okay. in his own home. He, he okay. Was, uh, and then we bought the investment property together uh, before we were married. So then how did you, like, how did you have, I don't want to say, willpower is not the right word. I guess, like, like, like it, the natural uh, American dream yeah. would have been yeah. instead like you're getting married, you're going to move in together, that you guys would have invested in a nicer home that you guys were going to like have babies in and like the yeah. white picket fence. So what went through your head like back then that made you decide to instead of leveling up, becoming more house poor personally sure. um, to do this? Like, was it just rich dad, poor dad? And that just like stuck in your head? Yeah, you know, at the time, my husband, well, boyfriend, um, did own a home, and the whole idea of house hacking is where you may, um, you know, you live in part of the house and you rent. Right now, rent by the room is a very, very popular strategy right now, where people are actually renting rooms to have the most profit in a, in a, in a property. Well, my husband did that 20 years ago. We did that, like that's been around forever. And what what he did with the house he owned, because I was living I was living for free with my parents, so I was at least saving money for a down payment that we could buy a house for our own ourselves, and we did do that simultaneously. And I'll share the size of that house because it's a lot smaller than the the normal house that a lot of my friends were buying. But that house that my husband was was living in right simultaneously when we bought the investment property, he had three his three bedrooms, and so he rented out two of them. And um, after he got this idea from you know kind of getting around real estate investment groups, reading, we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, we started going to like the RIA meetings. And that idea came out of it where you can actually kind of house hack your property and make money. He made $40 a month uh, from renting out the two rooms, covering all of his expenses, mm -hmm. and he netted, you know, um, 40 bucks. Now, 40 bucks is not like game changing money, but just the concept mm -hmm. was like, okay, this is, this is very, this is very interesting. That was really like, now, I, didn't, I wasn't living there, but I was part of like, you know, helping him and get, get that structured. And it really started to open our eyes like, wow, you can be, you know, what, what a leverage point. And so um, that's what then caused us to say, okay, can we buy a duplex? So we don't not, and if we don't even live there, we can make money with two of the units, right? Um, but then where are we going to live? Because we're starting our life together. And we ended up buying a, like a row home, uh, much more, it was like he quit his job at the same time too. So we actually bought a place that was much lower expenses, not the wicked, you know, no, no white mm -hmm. fence. Um, and most of my peers, if you will, when they get married are buying probably that more single family, you know, everyone's so excited about. We didn't, we were like, we're going to live below our means. We're going to buy something um, that we can afford that I knew on my salary I can afford while we started our business. Cause we had a couple of rental properties. It's not like you're making all this money from, from two rental properties. That's just not how it works. So yeah, it, that's, that experience with the house hacking really like was like, whoa, this is really powerful, right? Uh, where you can actually be making money with the property versus losing money. Right. So talk to me about like, so I feel like there's kind of this, there's these different levels of how invested people start to get into real estate. So like kind of, yeah. I picture this first level as like they own less than five. Sure. Right. Yeah. And then like, then it kind of moves into what's that like next level? And like, how do people kind of evolve through this? And what are like the pros and cons of going from like this, like, or like staying in this level versus moving yeah. on to the next one? There's so many different types of paths. And, and the, the, the interesting part I'd say to Lauren is like, so many people think there's one path. They think owning more property, owning more doors is going to yield more money. And Yes, from the perspective, if you, you know, if you structure a business that way, 
but it may not be for everyone. I was just speaking with a woman the other day and she has a goal of buying one property a year. She loves her job. She's a high paid attorney, but she wants to build wealth. And that's her way of doing it and how she structured her life. Other people are like, I want to do this full time. You know, I love real estate. I love properties. I love HDTV. Um, so they structure it differently. I think if people have to start with the end in mind. And in, in, in real estate investments is just like any investment vehicle. Um, it's a vehicle. It's a tool. So that is not enough if you don't really know where you're headed and where you're going. And I think that's always the first thing that I recommend to the women in our community is like, you know, what is that North Star? You know, in five years, what does life look like for you? You know, are you are you are you still working full time if that's what you're doing now? Are you scaling back and spending time doing other things? What are those other things you're doing? Um, what kind of finances do you need? Do you need, you know, more cash flow? Is it something you want to save money and put money aside because your kids are at that age where you want to put money aside for their college? Like, what are your financial goals? What are your money goals? And I think then once you get clear, then you can start to say, okay, what what investment strategy could it yield back for me? Because if someone's like, I want to make, you know, I want twenty five properties and I want to make forty thousand dollars per month in cash flow. All right. Listen, I'm all about possibility, but you also have to look at what can you do with mm -hmm. the market and the type of property. So can you say more about that? Because yeah, I think a lot of people think like, oh, you own five, four properties or 20 properties. You must be like rolling the dough. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, I, I and I have people and it's it's really unfortunate. I have we have a lot of women in our, our community that own property. And um, when I say, how, how are those properties doing? What's the cash flow? What's the equity in those properties? And you start to really like start to decipher like the, you know, the return on their investment. They can't answer those questions. Um, people can't even answer those questions for their own personal residence, let alone their investment properties. And I think that's a, that's a I would say a problem and I don't want to shame anyone, but that's important. Like sometimes people could be doing better if they actually optimized and stabilized what they have. Um, versus looking on the on the outside. So, so a couple of thoughts. You know, you, you have a few different assets, right? You have a single family home. It's the most commonly purchased property in our community of of women who, uh, or people. Women are the women in our community. So I just speak women because that's who we serve. But say I want to buy a single family home. You got the property, and then you have a strategy. I want to do a short term rental. I want to have a long term tenant in that in that property. Um, there's so many different ways to kind of the strategy and the asset kind of go hand in hand. So when you start to assess what is needed in a market, what's needed, um, you then look at, okay, what can this yield in terms of, of, of revenue, right? That's the whole, uh, the whole point, you know, in terms of cash flow. Um, and then you start to dissect it. And then there's ways to, to do that. Um, but I think the, the bigger question, and I'll just give you a simple one, like with short-term rentals or rent by the room, those are strategies. Mm -hmm. on the same asset. Like you could take a single family home and just have one tenant. You could have five tenants because of the way you structure it. All of the different strategies could be profitable or not, but that also has to yield your time, how much time you're willing to spend, you know, how much, you know, money you have to spend, you know, to invest if it's your own money and energy. You know, if someone's like, I want to build a business that's very hands-on, but I, I work full time and I don't really have much time to give, like some of the folks that you probably serve in, in your community, mm -hmm. that may or may not be the right fit, right? For that person. The woman I was talking to the other day, she, like I said, buys one property a year. It's like, no, I don't want to deal with short-term uh, rental tenants. No, no interest. Anything that takes a lot of my time, I'm not interested. I want a long-term tenant, a month lease and call it, call it good. I said, well, you could, could you make more money with that single family home? She's like, probably don't have any interest. It's going to mm -hmm. cost me more time. So it's all like a balancing act of like, where's my North Star? Let me work backwards um, to what is maybe the right investment decision for me. And then how do I squeeze more lemon out of that, you know, uh, squeeze more lemonade out of that lemon? And, and um, more is not always better. And, and that's coming from someone who has a couple thousand units right? With, with a lot of investors, right? We have 400 investors. So we own a piece of a lot of our properties. We do not own all of it. That's the business that we've built. Is that necessary for everyone? I would probably say no. Right. Right. It depends. I, like, you know, you know I, I don't think anybody who has like a, a stable job or just even a full-time job, maybe it's not that stable, is going like, I want to start a business that's super hands-on. Um, 
Correct. I would say, and let me know if you would disagree with this, that I would guess 90% of people start buying their first real estate properties thinking it's, and, and they would say, oh, I want to create more passive income. Correct. Correct. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm over here like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tickle my throat. Did you say passive? Okay. Correct. And there's, and I always like, and I always like to say too, when people are, and you know, technically, right. There's different ways money is structured, right? So, so technically they could be earning passive, right. But is it passive in the sense to your point, how much time is needed to, to one, find a property. So it's a process, right. And then manage mm -hmm. it and, and what have you, you know, I, I think in this day and age too, people need to look at if they like real estate, buying the property and kind of being this, like the operator, if you will, finding it, finding the contractor, finding the tenant, you're at the helm, right? There's another option called passive investing, where, where literally you are investing in, in an operator, or you're either lending money to projects, or you're you're kind of like a partner in, in a limited partner in, in mm -hmm. bigger projects. That's kind of how we grew our, grew our businesses with more with limited partners. You have less control. One has more control, right? More upside. One has less control. And, and you can almost argue, maybe depends on how you structured it, but the time piece is also part of it and the risk piece. And so all of that matters. There's no one way to, to, to slice and dice it. But if someone's like, you know, I need a 10% return on my money. I want to do better. I don't like the stock market. You know, that that's doable in, in passively investing and not having to do anything as long as you're vetting the, the, the operators, right? Because now you're in control of that. You're making the decision to invest with a particular company or, or project, right? Right. So passive, yeah, is a, is a term that's like super loaded. And I think people need to really look at, like you're saying, and there are some people that really want to get their hands involved and they, and they have the energy, the time, and others don't and have any interest. So that will dictate, do you want to take an active route or a passive route? And then right. if you take a passive route, what is that financial return you really need and want to make that time well spent, money well spent. Right. That's okay. where you talked about, like, start with the end in mind. Like yeah. there's, yeah, like more passive is going to, like you said, you're going to have less control. There may be less of a return depending on things like, yeah. So you were saying 20 years ago, yeah, you know, you had read this and like that your fiance at the time like he was surrounded by people thinking and talking like this. And I feel like so many of the people in my audience, like I said, they're chiropractors and they, they're they not surrounded by people talking about this. They're, ta they're surrounded by their peers that are talking about building a brick and mortar practice and building the practice. And, and like, that's the only like way to talk. And honestly, there's almost this like, if you're talking about building wealth in a different way, it's like confusing of like, why aren't you focused on your, on your practice? Yeah. Um, but it does seem like, I don't want to say real estate is having a moment yeah. because obviously, um, but like, it seems like everybody's talking about real estate right now. Is that just my algorithm or is mm. it more popular than it and more common to be discussed in circles than ever before. It's a really good point. You know, when I back in the day, right? Because I've been at this a long time. I think when I was like telling my my you know friends what I was doing, they're like looking at me like I had fifteen heads. You know, right? Um, they're like, well, you know, um, I, you know, I think it is. I think it is more common. I think people listen calling it an alternative investment because that's kind of like what real estate is called is more of like an alternative investment i guess compared to to you know uh portfolio where you're doing more stock investing that's where the more more common is right but i do think you know i think there's such an appetite for people wanting to like take control and i think they do see real estate in a sense as one of those like i'm in the control seat even if you're passively investing you're still controlling where your money goes, how it goes, and you're the one at the helm, the, the helm of that versus here's my 50 grand, uh, Mr. Financial Advisor, go put it wherever you want. And I think we're at a point, maybe it's generational, may, I don't know, right? That that might have something to do with it. People do want more ownership and um, and more kind of like control. That's the, the That's the sense I get, especially the women in our community. They're like, 
And statistically, women are coming into more wealth. I could just speak to women in particular because they can, I think the st stats from Fidel Fidel Fidelity are $10 trillion right now women control in terms of the economy. That's going to 30 trillion in the next three to five years. I love that. Yeah. And that's huge from the perspective of inheritance or for a lot of different reasons, right? You're seeing an upswing of women who are single, uh, women who uh, are recently divorced. You're seeing so many women buying their houses by themselves, right? So you're seeing this whole dynamic happening, at least from a, a, a female perspective that I'm interested in, in serving and, and want, that's what we do because it's this wealth transfer happening. So there's like money, it's like, what do I do with this? Do I go give it to this person? Do I just learn a little bit of what I wanna do? And so I feel like people feel like real estate ultimately is a little more of like control um, and it's a tangible asset. And statistically it's much it's very stable as an asset class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you it, that in 20 years I've been investing. I mean, I've invested in like up and up in up and coming areas. I've invested in areas that no one ever wants to go because from a safety perspective, and even those properties have fared well. Even so, though, yeah. And you know, I, I'm a I'm obviously a very um big fan of, of investing, but I think people need to diversify. They need to be smart. They need to, like you're saying, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur as well. So if I have money, I'm going to invest in my business or I'm investing in real estate. That's where I put my money. I, I'm not someone who puts it in the stock market just because I don't know it. I don't know it right. like I know real estate. And I don't know like my business, right? Right. Well, and there's kind of that like, okay, I'm making money. Do I pour it back in my business? Do I buy my own first home? Do I invest it? Or a lot of the listeners have like $200,000 of student loan debt. Yeah, And sure. so like, I think that, you know, would you say, I know this varies so much, you're going to hate this question, but like in general, if somebody's like, well, am I making enough? Like they probably need to have 30 to 50,000. Like, is that like, are you comfortable like being like, yeah, save up or, you know, I guess pay down, get equity on your home to get, so you have a HELOC, 30 to $50,000 of a HELOC available. But like, that's kind of like, all right, now do something with that. There's so many ways we could take this, right? Cause I have, so many, I have so many simultaneous answers. Cause there's yeah. so many, so here, here's what I would say. I would say too, I'm I'm a really big fan of like people getting, people having a handle on their personal income and their personal expense. Why I'm answering your question that way is because so many times people don't know their numbers. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to buy an investment property, I don't care if you have 50,000, 100,000, you can take that money, buy an investment property and still be mismanaging it. Right. So it's not right. so much the, the money, it's the approach and the thinking. And so if you don't know what your 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 household ex expenses are right now um, and have a handle on that and say, OK, this makes sense. It, you know, and this is my income. I'm good with that. Um, how can I and, and then what are my assets? Like if you don't have a kind of a, an understanding of your kind of personal financial life, if you will, that's number one, in my opinion, because then you can start to say, OK, Part of that, I have student loan debt. Okay, what's that costing me? I'll give you a, a great example. I, I was raised in like, you pay your debts off. Like, there's no good debt. Right, we have debt, debt. debt. Right. It was like, you have debt. And like, yeah. you know, I come from my family members who like pay their homes off. Right. So that's the, you know, and then you start to learn these other strategies and you're like, hold on, there's good debt and there's bad debt, right? So right. not all debt's bad, depending on how you structure it. So I had, I think, um, you know, I went to grad school quite some time ago. I had loans, quite a bit of loans from going to get my master's and um, they were at a 3% interest rate. I had the money, I think it was like 15,000 at the time to pay off the loans. Or 3%? It was crazy, right? <laughs> 3% is yeah. almost free money. <laughs> it, it was pretty much free money. And yeah. I was like, you know, people talk about their mortgages, right? And you're like, oh, the days of 3% mortgage. We have one of those. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, never I, I, I kind of, I'm in that boat and I love, I just want to hug my house sometimes. My I know. Friends, you know? <laughs> yeah. If I could, if I could hug my house, I, I probably would. But yeah. um, so, so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to pay off this, this, this money. I'm going to pay off this money. And we had a choice to take that 15K and invest it in, in, in a property. You have to look at the return on the money. So if you said, okay, I could put this 15,000 and make 10%, it's costing me. You know, I could pay off and, and make it, you know, pay off the 3%, but that's a yield of 7%. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. Now I'm making 7%, right? So if that is very simple math, yep. that is a way to think about your debt. Now, if that debt is at 
10% or something ridiculous and it's like totally causing this drain on your finances, then that is the part, that is the piece to take care of first because that's kind of the hierarchy. So there's two ways to think of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, yeah, pay down your debt. Well, it depends on the debt cost of you and if you can make more money somewhere else. If the answer is no, then yeah, that does make sense to say, okay, this money that I'm shelling off every month, I could be, I could be you know, maybe paying a little more so I can get that quote unquote bad debt taken mm -hmm. care of. And then since I'm used to paying it off, now that money can go into a savings account and that money could be my starting money to buy my first investment property. That to me would make sense if that cost me a lot of money. But in my situation, I ended up, we ended up investing that money, making more in a yield and then making more from there that I ended up. At, at when it started to fluctuate the interest, I was able to pay. When it you off. say more in a yield, a high yield savings account, or no, more in like I was saying, like okay, it's cost me three percent. Oh, okay. able to, I was able to put it somewhere at ten percent. You know, I'm I'm, I'm yep. at a positive seven percent, which made right. sense. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, if that positive was one percent, no, not worth it. Right. Right. It, you know, it has to make 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 sense for the energy. But um, I, is ten you know, percent kind of the the average? expectation like of whether it's a syndicate or buying real estate like is 10 percent kind of a safe assumption i'm using 10 percent because of um more on the, the the passive side meaning if i was um we work with companies that actually are sponsor sponsors of ours all the time where they come to our conference and they'll share like opportunities for women who like i got money to invest and i just don't see a good opportunity right now mm -hmm. so there's certain companies that will say listen we have a fund and we're lending money out to fix and flippers, you know, so to speak, then there's like a, you know, they have a guarantee of, of a minimum of 10%. Um, then there's other syndications that where, you know, depending, depends on when they bought the property, depends on the upside. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, we've given returns back up to 20%. Mm -hmm. um, it all depends on, on when the, the property was bought, how it's being managed, but um, I see te I'm using 10% just as a as a kind of like a eight eight to 10% or, right. or at the minimum kind of thing. Um, other people are like, I love the stock market and I'm going to keep doing that. And I'm like, well, just when the stock market's working, when it's not, you know, that's when it goes places. But again, I'm not a stock market expert and I'm sure you can win there. I just, I don't know the strategies there. I do know with, with real estate, but I'd say it's fair at the very minimum to expect that kind of return on my money if I'm passively investing. If I'm buying the property at like X, I'm, you know, the one managing that single family and I'm I'm doing the work, the returns can be much higher than that. Right. Okay. Got it. I've heard short-term rentals and those more labor intensive uh type of strategies, not labor intensive, because you could even streamline a lot of short-term rentals and vacation rentals. But that I people say that they've yielded a lot more return because mm -hmm. it's more, a little more um you know, hands-on, et cetera, versus like a one yep. time. Makes total sense. Yeah. So you had used the phrase when you were talking to like, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people in the community, mm -hmm. I encourage them to focus on optimizing and stabilizing what yep. they have first. Yeah. Can you talk more about that and what you mean? So like, like if I'm like, sure. oh, I'm just really excited. I want to, I want to get into real estate. I've got like, you know, $40,000 access to that, that I, and I'm looking for, I, I you know, I, I'm aligning with my core values and yeah. I'm determining what I want. But like, when you're like, hold up first, let's optimize and stabilize. What does that mean? Yeah. When, when I said that to you, that's for the woman uh, or the person who may have an existing property, like an existing investment property. Okay. Often people have one or two investment properties. And when they look back, they're like, you know, I could have, I, I may have paid a little more. I should have done this. I should have done that. So they need to learn, like in a sense, like you're optimizing this, this maybe single family home rental that you have. Uh, meaning, are you, uh, do you have the expenses in a good place? Can you, can you look at anything there that needs to get reduced? Are you mm -hmm. overpaying for something? People don't even know what they're paying for half the time on their household, let alone in an investment property. Income-wise, people often that are newer to the game that might have that one property don't realize that they should be charging $400 more in rent because they have no idea what the market is, is, is yielding in that area or what's happening on that next, next block. So when I say optimizing, it's more for someone who may have that existing investment or two. They're not professional investors, right? They're not doing this full-time. So they may not know all the opportunity to get the most 
profit out of that out of that, out of that property. And I just say that is an important one for people who have a property or two, um, because then then you're really treating it at a as a business, and and b you're really creating the kind of like routine so that you can do that again. And whether you do that once a year, whether you do that slowly and steadily, I've seen the, some of the best portfolios built very slow and steady because you're learning, you're growing, mm-hmm. you're doing it in a way that works for you more and, and faster, you know, in, in anything, right? Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but you can really, especially in this business, you're not dealing with a couple thousand dollars, usually dealing with more zeros. So so that can also be something to be mindful of. Right. Uh, and it's not like... You know, I don't like this property. It's going to sell tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It's not as flippant as just like, yeah, I'm just going to sell it tomorrow. And no, it doesn't work that way. It's a longer term asset, right? You have it longer. Right. So um, that's what I meant by optimizing and stabilizing. Okay. The the other thing I would say on a, on a global level is like the stabilizing and optimizing of your of your current assets and your current income. I think there's people who do have assets. Maybe they have a 401k that they don't realize they can put into a self-directed IRA Mm -hmm. and begin investing the way they want to invest. So even just from a personal, I have no investment properties. What is like my, like my, you know, personal financial world look like? There's super crazy rules around that though, too, right? Like you can't be hands on, like, so you couldn't pull and this is just my understanding. So tell me if I'm wrong, like you couldn't, pull your 401k, turn it into a self-directed, and then create a short-term rental that you're managing. I think that's the key. And and yeah. obviously you want to talk to a, there's people- There's a lot of rules, so basically. Many custo- yeah. yeah. And there's so many good custodians. They're called uh, self-directed IRA custodians. And in a sense, you're putting your money, if you were to convert you know, from a 401k into a self-directed, and it's not just real estate. You can actually invest in a variety of alternatives. Mm-hmm. Which is which is I think super cool, and it's just done by like three percent of of Americans. Like it's very low who actually is doing that, um, and I think that's an opportunity. But yeah, there are restrictions, right? I would always go to the custodian, um, but the whole idea is that just like in a four hundred one k, it's a retirement account. Self directed IRA is used in the same vein, meaning you're really building that retirement account. So, for example, I'll give you a quick example. We were um, building three new construction. It's actually a project me and my my, my business partner now, Andressa, who's my co-founder on Invest Her Together, building three new construction. We needed about a hundred, about 200,000 for like the down payment. Three new construction. We got most of the construction of this of these buildings um, covered by a bank, right? Local bank was going to give us the construction loan. Great. But you're still, you still need the down payment money. So we had a, um, an investor who had a self-directed IRA. He lent us $200,000 out of the self-directed. And we had an agreed upon interest rate. So we were going to pay him 8% Mm -hmm. plus, I think, 12% of our profit. So he had some upside. And that's Mm -hmm. all done together, totally legal, fine, great. And you have to make sure you have all the right paperwork. We did that. Project sold, did very well at the project. Obviously, paid him back his 8%, his guaranteed return, and his 12%. All that money, right, all the money he made from that project, which was significant for him, went back into his self-directed. So he didn't take mm-hmm. that money and go to like, you know, Hawaii or anything. Right. So all that money went back. But it, in a sense, your self-directed IRA is similar to like a 401k in the sense it is a, it's a retirement account, right? So people that have it want to just make it, make it getting, um, keep working it. Meaning they, now I gave him a problem. I gave him all his money back and his, his profit. He's like, I got to deploy that money again or I'm not making any money. So right. when you look at these vehicles as, as retirement accounts, in terms of like what you can and can't do. Um, yeah, there are there are ways to just make sure you understand. I know people that you can buy a property or who's doing the work, who's managing it. That's when there's limitations. But again, talking to a custodian, you'll know what the right. Don't ask your neighbor. Don't right. ask Uncle, Uncle Joe. They don't know. You know, ask a custodian, a self-directed custodian. Even I know enough, and I'm like, I have to ask them this because I'm not sure. You know, right, right. So, what are your thoughts on your first couple? sticking local, like, because you know, the area versus researching up and coming, like, I'm sure there's lists of like, and Nashville is probably not one of them anymore. Um, But like, these are the areas that, you know, are projected, like real estate's low and projected to grow. Yeah. So I always like to say like, and I don't think I thought this way when I started, um, but you want to mitigate, you always want to mitigate your risk, right? You Mm want to reduce risk. 
just like a business owner, um, you know, you want the most upside potential with mitigated your risk, right? That's like the beautiful scenario you want. So, you know, I I was always, my, my husband and I, we got started and for about eight years, we would not invest outside of 30 minutes. That was our radius. That's what we did. Now we were in New Jersey. New Jersey right. arguably is one of the worst places to, 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 to buy real estate and to invest in real estate because of the taxes and the, oh my God, I can give you a whole long list of reasons. Um, we've sold a lot of our Jersey properties. And now we, we invest a lot more in the Southeast. But um, my point in sharing that is that was a level for us, we were able to control it, right? Mm -hmm. You, you could learn within on. a safe, yeah. Correct. Um, now, in, in people's situations that they may live in California or they may live, you know, and then I've heard people make it work in California. Other people are like, I don't invest in California. Um, you want to, you also want to be, you want to mitigate your risk. So if you have, say, knowledge about a community that is within an hour and a half of your home and you know it and you've been around it a long time or you grew up there, then you've mitigating your risk because you have a knowledge base of that market. To me, that's mitigating your risk versus it being just an hour and a half. Well, an hour and a half to an area I don't know versus an area I do know because I actually grew up there or my 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 aunt lives there and I visit her like three times a year. And I'm always seeing all these buildings popping up. Like there's stuff happening, you know, that kind of thing. I I think it's all about mitigating your risk and it's all about knowledge. Um, and the more you have that knowledge and you're able to connect with people locally, the better. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of like getting comfortable and familiar in, in, within, you know, with your neighborhood, if you can, but mm -hmm. some people's markets are not able to do that. Right. And it, it, they're outpriced or there's just not an opportunity. I'll also say though, there's always an opportunity for affordable housing, meaning there's always a need for people to afford where they live. That is an issue in our country, right? People are getting, they're continually like this, the city, right? And it's like an hour outside the city and then two hours outside the city. People are, you know, the, the need to be able to afford where you live or where you want to live is always a need. So the communities that are solving that problem are always like more up and coming communities, right? You see um, not just the million dollar homes going up, but you see the starter homes and hmm, that's interesting that that's happening here. And you know, it's just like when you start to look at markets from a real estate perspective and an economic perspective, it's interesting. Coffee shops and cities that are really uh, investing the money and making it easy for people, having incentives, all that kind of stuff matters, you know. So is that what you're like, what kind of resources are you referencing before you would invest like in an area? Like you're yeah. looking for affordable housing being built. That's a good sign. Like Affordable housing. When I say affordable housing, and I don't even mean from like a government perspective, I mean like houses that are houses that are people can afford to to buy in that community. Meaning like you know more like that. I I, I like. I mean I'm not a flip fix and flipper, but if I was fix and flipping, I would want to fix and flip in an area that I know um, hands down is needed, right? So if the top of the market's a million, you know the bottom of the market's three hundred thousand. I would love to be, you know, fixing and flipping in, in closer to the 300 than the million, right? Because yep. there's more buyers, more, mm -hmm. more people that need that that product, if you will. You know, from a market perspective, you know, it, it, it you can get into a lot of complexity. Of course, when we started, we were like, what are we close to? <laughs> you know, now I know, knowing what I know, there's so many things. One, one is is their job growth. Our our companies. Are bringing more jobs to this area? Is there, are people moving to this area or are mm -hmm. people leaving this area? Really simple, right? New Jersey, right? People are not as much going there. They're leaving and they're going south. There's, so why are they going to North Carolina? Okay, that's interesting. You know, that kind of thing. So job growth. Um, I also like job diversity. People are always like job growth, job growth. But if you don't, if you see like one type of like industry in, a, in an area, tech, mm -hmm. there's nothing else besides tech. Well, what happens when tech goes away? What happens right. when that manufacturer that employs the entire neighborhood goes away? That's a problem. So I think diversity of kind of like sector is really important. Like, is there a few different sectors happening? Is there like, you know, um, university towns? Um, I was just talking to someone on our, our podcast about it and she builds student housing. That's her niche. She bought, she builds, um, you know, buildings for, for students and, um, that's a niche, right? Because there's a need because some of these kids don't have, there's no housing for them, right? On so many of these different college campuses. 
So I say all that because the market does depend, local markets matter. And then you start to see job growth, um, economic growth. Is there incentives? You know, is it town want, like, you know, do, do they want development to happen? If their town, if you keep seeing this town is like, town voted against this development, town, did, you know, that's not a good sign mm-hmm. to me for regulations or, you know, because the, then I, I'm not, not because I'm a big developer, but I want to see that there's a, there's almost like a business friendliness to that town. There's right. a real estate friendliness and not every town is that way. Do you, this may be a stupid question. Maybe it's not like, is there a point where you're too late to the game? Like we talked to, I talked about how, like, it seems like everybody is just probably my algorithm right now, but like everybody's getting into it. Like, are we, is it too late for the flipping? Is it too late to get into the short-term rental? Like, I don't know. Here, here's what I think. Because Black Gar- Blackstone and Vanguard are coming in and buying everything, right? Like, so now, is it now like we're too late? Now we're competing with with them? I, you know, I think there's a, the, the, your point's well taken, right? There's a lot of big, big players that never, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and honestly, they're, they're buying, they're buying some of these bigger buildings and not really worried about like cash flow. Like they're right. sort of like a long-term parking their money, quite honestly, mm-hmm. it, it's a stable asset to park their money. No, I don't, I don't, I'm a believer that it, here's what I think, cause I've been at this a long time. I think that it's, it's always a good time to buy. It's not, it's, it's, it's not always a good time to buy the same asset or the same and have the same strategy that varies mm. because of the market that we're in or what's happening. Right. People are like, we're already in a recession. It's going to get worse. There's always a way to my belief, right. Especially when it comes to housing, housing is a basic need. Everyone. And I do believe this. I feel I believe everyone has a, has the right to live somewhere, a safe place. Right. I do mm. believe that. And so if you come from that premise, right. Of housing as a general piece, then, then you start to say, okay, can I be late to the game in, in an Austin, right? I, I, we had our conference in Austin. It's an adorable area. I don't own anything in Austin. If I'm now going into Austin and saying, I w- maybe there's a, uh, your point's well taken. In that particular market, maybe in the particular cycle it's in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you could also say, am I late to the game in Austin in commercial? Well, you may not be because that sector, that asset class is, still kind of like no one knows about. So my opinion though, is it is mar- very market oriented. So when yep. you say late to the game, yes, that can happen in certain areas and in certain strategies, right? I do believe though that in certain markets and there's always an opportunity for market that is like kind of secondary. Um, there's so many secondary markets that are thriving that there's still a lot of opportunity. Then you talk about strategy. So market and then strategy, like, oh, I can I can build a home here versus buy an existing home, right? So yeah, I'm not a big fan that this says it's all late to the game. I think- Right, you may be too late in a, yeah, like Austin and Nashville, the homes may not be the best place to be looking for an investment at this point or- Well, and and also if you don't know your numbers. So meaning right. there could be that Nashville homeowner that is just so distressed, so frustrated, but they're done. So mm-hmm. then you become late to the game if you're overpaying. That's when you're really late to anything. Yes. Yep. That's the name of the game, right? And if you don't know your numbers, if you don't, if you know don't know if you're overpaying. We were just looking. Yes. My husband and I literally right before this podcast were looking at some of our our properties, and because we had a we always have our Friday business meeting, and we were looking at some of our properties. And you know, we bought a property during COVID, and then we bought a property like about a year after COVID. Arguably, in the same market, we paid more uh, for that property after COVID than we did COVID. Um, with the thought that our rents were also going to go up and some of that hasn't transitioned because there's one part of the town and the other property is another part of the town. So you got to remember, rental growth aligned with property value always matters. And, and that all matters in the, in the, you have to know the market and you don't have to know everything about the market. You need to have a broker and people that do know more than you. I, we're never the ones that know everything about everything, but just to base it on your own knowledge is where you're going to, you're going to get stopped in this process. Don't rely on yourself, right? You got to have somebody who knows that local market, kind of knows what's happened and where it's going. And then you're able to say, what is the real rent that I can get for this property? Mm-hmm. You know, versus compared to what the value of the property is. That's the that's what you're hedging, not just the cost of the property, but what because you know, you could argue that a million dollar property, if I get more of a rent, then same as a two hundred thousand dollar property. If I'm getting it's not just more money, maybe yep. more rent, right? Yep. I love, I just 
I love hearing you explain this because these like these concepts, like it, like you're like, well, it's not that easy. And people want the like black and white. Tell me what to do. There's one path in. And it's like, well, no, you got to do like you got to know your numbers, which chiropractors are terrible at, by the way, uh -oh. All like, right. <laughs> terrible at. Are you more nervous about large commercial spaces post COVID with the whole like work from home? Like is commercial a riskier, like riskier than it was pre pandemic? You know, I, it's a, it's a tough question because I don't know that asset class very well. I do know though, when I come, when I think, cause we're, we're passive investors. So my husband and I also, if we sell a building, like we have an active investing, we also passively invest with people we trust, like, and respect. Cause we also like the idea of just getting a page, getting a, getting a check and not having to do anything for it because we're building other businesses. And they're investing in a warehouse. And the warehouse is in, in Philadelphia. The warehouse has a like 30-year lease or something ridiculously high with the government. So to me, that's like, okay, well, let's talk about the risk, right? Right. It's a 30-year lease. Well, you can't even, you can't compare that to a residential uh, property or right. short term. You talk about risk, like my risk is low. In investing and I'm passively investing with a strong operator and they're well funded. So to me, that was like a no brainer after we looked at everything. But I say that because that makes sense because of the way it's structured in a city atmosphere. So for me to say commercial doesn't make sense. I, I don't I don't know that answer particularly, right. but I would say I would say that because there is a housing shortage, more there's more there's more residential needed than, more than need. commercial. So people are being super smart, like in some of these boutique towns, they're converting, you know, maybe like a three-story smaller commercial building to, you know, law style uh, mm -hmm. residential. Like I see that as if it's invited and encouraged and incentivized, not that we're doing a ton of that, but that's like a no brainer to me because it's right. like you're meeting a need with an, like an asset class that might be, you know, there's a lot of vacancy. Let's, let's be frank, right? Not everyone, not everyone needs like the warehouse space for that. And that's not what a boutique town needs. They don't need warehouse. They need they need this beautiful little cute little place that people are feel like it's inviting. They can go in uh, to the coffee shop or the handbag place or the designer place, right? They don't want this like eyesore and vacancy because that's people are not going to want to live there, right? So, um, but yeah, I think there since COVID, there it's still a big issue. There's a lot of vacant commercial space across the country that honestly needs to get redeployed, um, and the people that are doing it are doing well. It's just not every town is. God makes it easy. And that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. right? I always say you cannot control the market. You can only participate in it. Meaning you cannot control. I mean, people think they can, but they can't, you know, like, oh, I want to do this in this town. Well, that's great. But does the will the town let you? Yeah. yeah. And, and it seems like a common sense thing, but not every town is, has the same appetite. And that really, you know, again, Based, even just from a short-term rental perspective, talk about regulations. I'm a long-term tenant person. I've only had long-term tenants, but I know from people, right? Um, they struggle with 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 uh, or they're thriving, depending on the town. So, yeah, but you are kind of just one. I have short-term rental and um, and long-term rental and commercial, but like in our short-term rental. It's on a really popular lake. It gets Chicago money. It's a recession, like, you know, it's like oh, a recession proof that. thing. As soon as it goes yeah. down, you know, like, um, but we're one board meeting away from them passing an ordinance, you know, like it's something yeah. that like, you know, we can be active and try and preventing that. But like uh, the town we live in does have passed recently some short term short term rental regulations where you have to have a 30 day minimum stay okay. um and you have to like live in the area for like 6 months a year there's like just like in order to oh like just I'm like oh okay well good to know good to know what do you see coming down the pipe in 2025 like what are some of these predictions you're seeing um, with real estate investing, with pricing, like all that. Yeah, I mean, and that's a, here. here's what I'm doing to set myself up for success. Because at the end of the day, no one has like a crystal ball. Right. Um, you know, is there signs that that the economy is course correcting and that, you know, obviously there's like, you know, people are saying we're going to get into a deeper recession. The rece you know, there's going to be more of a, you know, a course correcting, I'll just say. I don't know. Prices of homes are potentially going to come down. 
Yeah, here, here's what I know. I, I do know that like for me to make an investment decision today, I want to be conservative. And then you say, well, how can I be conservative if I don't know all the numbers? You got to be around other people in the business. And that's why we've created the community we've created, because you want to be bouncing these things off of people that are in it, not speculating or on the sidelines or thinking about thinking about thinking about investing. No, these people have properties, right? And those are the people that I want to make sure I'm surrounding myself with. Recession time, or of course, correcting the economy, fear goes up, opportunity goes up too, mm -hmm. quite honestly, right? So like COVID, think about COVID hit. I would say in the last four years, one of our best performing properties was, was the one we bought literally June during COVID, hands down. Because why? Fear was high, opportunity came up, and you know you can, you can really thrive. So with any sort of economic course correction, there is always opportunity. You just need to, I think, be smart, be conservative, run it by people that are doing that type of strategy in that market. And if I'm looking at short-term rentals, in the Pocono Mountains in, in Pennsylvania, and it's my first one, I want to know people who are doing short-term rentals in the town that I'm looking in. And there's so many people who want to share. It's like, oh, well, why would they talk to me? I'm competition. There's a lot more people who want to help and share versus compete. I also like things that, I also like investments right now from a, like looking forward is markets that are just really, that thrive or stay the same or thrive during any sort of recession. 2008, you can even say, you know, there was a huge, you know, obviously what happened with the mortgage industry and just our world, right? There was economies, there was local economies that didn't miss a beat. There was other ones that like tanked. Mm -hmm. So you want to know, okay, why would, it, why, would it, why would a local, why would this local area tank or not? And start to be curious. And, um, and I think surrounding yourself with other people that are in the business helps and makes a difference. And I always like to say, when you buy something, be ultra conservative, have your worst case scenario and have multiple exits. So if it's short term, can you rent it out to a family and cover your nut if you needed to? You mm -hmm. know, what are the other strategies? You don't want to do that, but if you had to do that, you can cover it and kind of get through. People don't think about multiple strategies. They think about this like golden, this is the property that's going to make me a million dollars. I'm going to have it, you know, 80% occupied because of X, Y, and Z. And then it changes like your point. So always like run a couple scenarios and always bring out the worst case, but there's always an upside too. So if you can cover your worst case and it, and it makes sense, then, then you can kind of ride it out and ma make sure you kind of thrive or you put your money aside and you kind of wait. I mean, there's all different types of people and different mm -hmm. risk tolerances. I looked at a property the other day and it was an, a great opportunity in our town in where I live. And I know our market very well. It's a, like a small little boutique town that people visit very, um, you know, very uh, well visited, very well funded. The properties can go from like, you know, significant, right? So my husband and I looked at this property and we're like, it's like two seconds from our house. We're like, this is such a great opportunity. And we were like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? And we kind of ran that scenario. And because of our, our that scenario in this market, we just didn't want to take that leap. There was too many uncertainties. Even we knew the market. That just didn't make sense to us. So I think we're all figuring it out and we have to do what makes sense to us in in, in what's too much risk or what's enough, you know, what's, what's a little risk. So I don't have a crystal ball, but I mm -hmm. do know in times the fear goes up, there are more opportunities. So I want to encourage people to think that way versus like, wow, now I'm going to run from real estate. That's usually right. when there's more opportunity, actually. This is when there's more buying opportunity, things are cheaper. Buyers are like, I got to get rid of this property. I'm telling you more opportunity will, will pop up as we continue on. Are you positioned to buy it? And are you going to conservatively look at it and make sure you're running your numbers and setting yourself up for success? That's the key. Got it. So you've mentioned a couple of times making sure that you are surrounded by people who, who know. Um, tell the listeners where they can get more information on you um, and join your community. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of community because no one can know everything, right? <laughs> so, um, but you got to go, you have to surround yourself with like-minded people. Um, yeah, we have, a, we have a free Facebook community. It's um, uh, right in, uh, it's called the Investor Community. And uh, you can kind of post, we always like when people join us, our women join us, post a little bit about yourself, what you're looking for. And uh, we have free events that we do as well during during the month. 
And then we have a lot of ways we, we you know, engage with the women in our community to help them, to support them with the knowledge they need, the, the, the skills they need, and, the, and obviously the, the women around them. So Facebook groups, probably the best. It's the Invest Her community. Awesome. We'll have that link below. Um, Liz, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I know that like the, you have a course for like more advanced real estate. So like, if you listen to this and you were like, I know all this for the goods, like go check out, I'm sure yeah, there's details I, on that and stuff like that. But like, sure. I think this was a really great conversation on starting to get people just like my audience who they're they didn't they don't have an MBA in economics or you know like half of us don't even know (laughs) how a spreadsheet works right like and so these are the kind of conversations that are just like these the safe place to start learning because we feel so stupid as adults like that's something that I feel like holds so many people back where they're just like I don't even know what to ask. Like I don't want to sound like an idiot. And it's like well at some point in your life you didn't know how to do your job either but like sure. we're like with that was safe and so like i love creating these conversations um and then your podcast is the real estate invest her yeah podcast. It's, it's actually invest her podcast yeah okay it's a, and it's a weekly show and um and then we have an annual conference we do once a year it's next june uh in orlando and we bring 500 women together all supporting each other helping each other in building wealth for their lives in the way that works for their lives right mm-hmm. so But yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I I really appreciate it. Thanks, Liz. All right, She Slayers, until next week. Bye. Bye.